Hey, well, welcome uh, to New Covenant this morning. Would you just join me in prayer? Father God, we are here simply for one reason, God, to, to worship you, Father, to hear from you, to feel the Spirit working in us, to know that the Spirit has working in us. God, I believe that you have been working in each one of our hearts, Father, through this week, preparing us and molding us and, and working in our individual devotions and our time with you, Father, to hear this message. God, I believe this is a timely message. God, I'm thankful to be your instrument this morning up on stage, just being able to present your word. And God, I will admit, I don't feel worthy. But yet, you have called me and you have equipped. And God, you have just strengthened me with your spirit. And so what a privilege and, and how right it is that we get to talk about the Holy Spirit today. And so Jesus, we, we ask that right now you would just stir in our spirit. God, if there's any sin that you stir up, God, would we, we would be quick to deal with it, quick to confess it, quick to submit and get on our knees before you, God, and say, okay, I'm your child and I'm gonna obey right away, all the way, and with a happy heart. Let that be our mindset today. Let us worship you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, I, uh, I am so excited about today. Are you excited? All right, so here's the deal. I am Dusty Jones. I'm the high school and college pastor here. And what I love from audiences is uh, I love to hear back from you. And so uh, are you ready for this morning? Okay, you're not ready for me. What you're ready for is to hear from the word of God, right? The word of God is what's powerful. There is nothing in me that's powerful. There's nothing in my words that are powerful. It is all in the word of God. That's why we're here. And I'm excited to get into the word today. And if you're excited, come on, let's just give Jesus a hand because I'm excited. All right. Okay. So we are going to do a little practice. Are you ready? A little exercise. You're like, oh, it's in the morning time. I don't do exercise in the morning. Well, we're not going to do Pilates. We're not going to do, as Jay says, burpees all the time. We're not going to do that, but we are going to do a little exercise. So I'm going to count down. I'm going to say three, two, one, and then you're going to say, all of us together, we're just going to say the word unity, okay? So let's try that on three, two, one, and then unity, all right? Three, two, one. Oh, let's go. That's good. That is good. In Cedar Rapids, Iowa, right now this morning, that is good. And we're practicing here because we practice here. This is our kind of attaboy from God, right? You, you, that attaboy from God that as we go out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that the, that the Spirit wants us to be unified. And, and I want you to remember Let's do it one more time. Let's practice one more time because I want you to hear all of your voice. Okay, I want you to hear that. So let's try it again. Three, two, one, unity. unity. Perfect. Because when you are going through your week, I want you to remember that because the spirit wants us to be unified. As we look at the Godhead, we look at the Father, we look at the Son, and we look at the Holy Spirit. They are all equal in essence, yet they have different roles and responsibilities. The Holy Spirit, if you look in Genesis, before the foundation of creation, before the foundation of the world, all of God's purposes are unified in one purpose. God hasn't changed his mind. If you look in Ephesians, it says that so that Jesus might be, the, uh, the, might be made most of, that Jesus would be the one that it's all about. The unity, the, the grandest display of unity is that we have in the cross of Jesus. That Ephesians 2 said it broke down the walls that were the barriers between all of humanity, right? And for the Jews back then, that was the, the, the barrier between Jew and Gentile. Praise God that we don't have that barrier anymore because the cross, it stood as our uh, freer. Jesus stood in our place and took that and he has broken down all the barriers. And as we look at God's character, the reason that I don't feel equipped is because as we endeavor to look at God's character, none of us, I mean, all of us should, we really should fear and tremble because to go in and to, long in and to longingly look into the things of God, that is an awe moment where you stand in awe of who God is. 
That is a humbling moment where none of us should feel good, right? Um, when uh, I think it was Andrew who said a few weeks ago that when, it, when they come into the presence of God, it's when Isaiah came into the presence of God, he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I am wholly undone. And it feels like that as we look into the spirit. You know, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that it is the spirit of God that searches the depths of God. You and I, we don't have that capability. There is nothing in us that can search God, except for there is something in believers that can search God. What is that thing? It is the Holy Spirit. That as he searches God, as he looks in longingly to God and, and then reveals in us the things of God, we get to know God's character. We get to behold who he is, his divine attributes that have been clearly seen we get to see those and look in. And that, my friends, is a privileged position. We have the spirit. I mean, there is a reason that Jesus says, it's better that I go because I'm gonna send you somebody who is going to be better for you. And we live on this side of the cross and we get to have that spirit. And that is the spirit that we get to be unified in. And it's not this man-made unity and it's not about getting along. It's about imitating and looking like our God, that our God is unified. And so if our God is unified in the, in the persons of the Trinity, we as his people better be unified. The church better get it together and start imitating our God and be unified. For far too long, division has rippled across the fabric of the church. And that's got to stop. Because the spirit of God agrees with the spirit of God. And so if the spirit of God is in you and the spirit of God is in me, our spirits are gonna jive because it's one spirit. And that one spirit says the same thing. It teaches you the same thing and it teaches me the same thing. When I say unity, some of you might be discouraged about unity. You say unity is just a pie in the sky concept. It's ethereal. It's nothing to be grasped. And I would say I disagree with that. Do I believe that unity can be fully achieved here on earth in this moment? No, I don't. I don't believe. But Jesus prayed in the garden. Uh, I was talking to Andrew and he led me to this passage and this really just stuck in my mind. He said, uh, in the Lord's prayer, he said, on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is not gonna be just a bunch of people doing their own things. We are going to be unified, unified in our worship, unified under the presence of Jesus. We, all sin is going to be done away with. All tears will be wiped away. All the divisions, everything will be made right at that day of our glorification. And that's beautiful. But I don't think that right now we can achieve full perfect unity, but we can achieve progressing unity. That we as the church shouldn't give up on unity. Sometimes I have heard it said that unity is, well, unity is what pastors preach on when they can't go into the deep things of God. And I would say baloney. That unity is the deep thing of God. That unity is such an intricate part of who God is. He doesn't conflict against himself. If he did, he wouldn't be God. And so I believe that in the spirit, if you are living and walking by the Spirit, if you're a believer in Jesus today and you have the Spirit of the living God, and let me add this caveat, that you have been spending time with Jesus. Because the Spirit doesn't dwell you as a believer. But if you don't day in and day out press into God's character, then how will you hear from the Spirit? How will you know what the Spirit says? And so that is what we need to do is lean into the spirit because unity can be achieved. There is, a, and, I'm, and I'm gonna prove it because Jesus prayed some things, um, but what I want for us in Cedar Rapids is to be on mission for Jesus, that we need to be one in our efforts. Uni unity doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean the same. It means that in our difference, in our diversity, in the ways that God has gifted you, your unique talents, your gifts, your abilities, all of those things differ. Yours differs than mine. And how I am differs than how you are. But that's good. It's actually beautiful because it represents our God. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. They each have role and responsibility. Different. The Spirit wasn't to die on the cross. Jesus was. The Father wasn't to die on the cross. Jesus was. They, they have 
in their own, they have their own purpose, and you have your own purpose. It's to build up the body. It's to bring unity in the spirit. We have one mission. It is a big deal to God that we are unified. So big that in Proverbs 6, it says, or in Proverbs, it says that God despises, he, that there are, there are things that God despises and things that God hates. And the last one is that God hates a person who stirs up division amongst the believers, amongst the brethren. That God hates that. And if you're in my, if you're in my shoes, and you don't even have to be in my shoes, you can be in your own shoes, we all at one point or another have stirred up division amongst brethren. In little or small ways, gossip has come in. All the things that we have done have not all been unity in the spirit because there's moments where we don't walk by the spirit. And those are the moments where that should, that should be an urgent in our mind. It should be like, get back to Jesus. Get back to the spirit and lean in and push in to the spirit because he desires unity. And so it is, I mean, it is a big deal that we stay in the spirit. There are some main points that we're going to put up for you today. Um, there's three that I would like to lead you to. I, I love how some, some pastors leave it to the very end. They can't keep you on your seats until the very end. I'm like, give it to them. Let's just give it to them so that they can know. And if they need to sleep, they can sleep. But you're not going to sleep today because you're engaged. And I love it. Um, <clears throat> the key points are the mission depends on unity. Our mission as believers is twofold. It's to glorify God and to be his witnesses in the world. And it depends on the power and the unity of the Holy Spirit. We can't complete that mission if we're all divided. We cannot complete that mission if we're divided. Jesus said it to his disciples when they, told, when they talked about a man who was casting out demons. And they said, well, this man isn't, isn't a part of our group. He's not a part of us. Should he be casting out Jesus? And said, how can a house divided against itself self, self stand? Let that guy go and do his work. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Our mission this house, this spiritual house, not this building, but us, the body of believers, depends on the Spirit of God. The mission depends on it. Number two, the flourishing and thriving of the church depends on the unity of the Spirit. The church will only thrive when you lean into the Spirit and when you're walking by the Spirit and when you're living in tune with the Spirit. The church will only thrive, and I'm talking capital C church. I'm not talking about New Covenant. New Covenant's a part of that. You are a part of that. We are a part of the larger body of Christ, are we not? And when we are walking by the Spirit, we will thrive. We will not just survive. We won't be on defense like the church has been in the past. We will actually take the offensive role because there will be unity, and we will start to thrive. The watching world will see you and I as one and they will say, wow, all right? Just say wow with me, wow. Let's do it again, wow. That's what the watching world will see. We're gonna look at it in John 17. So if you do have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John 17. But our last point while you're turning to John 17 is that our pursuit of God and others depends on unity found in the Holy Spirit. Our pursuit of God depends on the unity found in the Holy Spirit. Our, our mission statement is to pursue God, pursue others, and practice his ways. Apart from the Spirit of God who searches the depths of God, you cannot pursue God. You need the Spirit of the living God to reveal truths about God through his scripture to you. You don't have the power apart from him to know God. And, and, and on the same hand, you need the Spirit of God to help you pursue others. You need his help. Because when the Spirit of God says, Hey, go talk to that person at the coffee shop. And you take the step. It's like, oh man, I don't know what I'm gonna say right now. So spirit, you give me the words to say. That's why Jesus said, don't worry about what you're gonna say because in that moment, the spirit is going to speak through you and for you. And you know, you may have had those encounters in Jesus where you've been walking in and, and been obedient to the spirit's call and you're like, you get done with that conversation and it went swimmingly and you're like, I don't know what I said. I don't know how I came up with that wisdom. That wasn't me. That was other. That was God. That was the Holy Spirit moving in you and working in you. Unity, though, it does not begin with humanity. It can't begin with us. It isn't realized through humanity. When I say, let's be one, let's be unified, I don't believe that we can just muster up all of our courage and put on our little unity hats and, and say, let's go get them. We can't do that. 
Unity is, is realized through what I'm going to call the super spirit glue or spirit super glue. That if you think about a board and you're like gluing something together, that he is the super glue that will unify us. But if at any moment you don't participate in the bond of the spirit, that glue starts to weaken and you start doing your own things. You start saying things that are not in line with the spirit. You start doing things in, with your kids in your marriage, in your workplace, and we know what happens when I'm in control. It's chaos and disaster and destruction. But when the spirit is control, there's life, there's freedom, there's restoration found only in the spirit. And so isn't it just beautiful that we get to long, longingly look into who the spirit is today? I am excited, and I hope you're excited with me. It is a big deal that we are unified. John 17, 20 through 23, we'll put it up there. Jesus, before he went to the cross, prayed this. This is why I know unity is a big deal. I am not praying only on their behalf. He's talking about the disciples there. But also on behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony. That is me, that is you. Jesus was praying for us. And he says that they will be one Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, I pray that they will be in us so that the world will believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be, notice this, completely one so that the world will know that you sent me and you have loved them just as you have loved me. Is that not so good? Jesus could have prayed about a lot of things. Jesus could have said a lot of things. If if I'm honest, if I were Jesus, I would have been thinking about the thing that I was about to do. But Jesus, in all of his love and kindness, was praying for us because his mission wasn't about, it, it, it was about him, but it also included us. And in that inclusion of us, here he is praying that we would be one. It is a big deal that we as the believers of Jesus would be one. Our mission depends on it. That when we are unified, God is glorified. That when we are unified, God is made much of. Our mission depends on it. But our mission is twofold. Remember I said our mission is one, to glorify God, and two, to be witnesses to a watching world. That was Israel's mission. And that is our mission today, is to be witnesses to the watching world. My prayer for us, and as I, you know, I've been sitting in these seats like since last week, and, I, and over and over and over, God has been in my mind just helping me like think about this unity and this spirit. And when Jay was up here last week, I wanted to be just like, high five me, come on, I am ready to go, let's go. They can do another hour, I know they can, they got it in them. I have been ready for this. And this is why I wore this shirt today, because what I want from us as we walk out of here is to quit being divided and start living our unity in front of a watching world. We can't be a church that is divided and and has divisions and factions. We have to be a church who stands on the truth of God's word. People hear unity and they say, well, unity lessens holiness or it lessens God's word. I'm not saying give up on on the good things of scripture. I'm not saying lessen your doctrinal stances. We're not getting rid of those at all. But what we are doing, we're softening the edges on the things that are not essential and saying, you know what? You might believe this and I might believe this. And I do believe that scripture has an answer, but you also believe that scripture has an answer and somehow we don't see it the same. But you know what? The foundation is, is that you're a beloved child of God, made in his image, that he loves you, that he died for you, that you you have the living spirit inside of you and I have the living spirit inside of me. And even though we don't perfectly agree on everything, we can still be brothers and sisters. Like I can still live out our mission in our, in our neighborhood with you, even though you d- disagree on things like whatever that we disagree on as the church. I don't need to go into all of those because this is unity, so we're not gonna talk about the things we disagree. But Jesus, and that's why I'm wearing this because this says the Lord is my shepherd. The world will know who our shepherd is when we start following the shepherd's voice. They will know that we are one in Christ Jesus. And, it, and Jesus said it, I pray that you will be one, why? 
so that the watching world will know that you have sent me and that you love me. They see Jesus when we are unified. The world doesn't often stand in awe of the church because the church is divided. Like, we often talk about, oh, evangelism. Let's go out and evangelize. Let's go do it. Let's go share the word of God. But here's the secret sauce. Jesus said it. The secret sauce for the watching world is that we would be unified. This is the secret sauce. Is that we would be unified. But we don't, we don't talk about that often because we're too busy worrying about, did you hear what they said in small group? Can you believe they believe that? I don't believe that they believe that. Like, we're too busy because there, there are moments, I have done it and you have done it, there are moments where we step out of the spirit. Our unity is our believability to a watching world. Better than any apologetic is how we live unified in the spirit. The spirit in me and the spirit in you will help us because we don't have what it takes to be unified. We don't. We can't rally under the cross without the power of the Spirit. And so this is a call. If you've walked away or you have never even um, accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you don't have the indwelling Spirit within you, this is a call to come back. This is a call to come to him. His Spirit is free to you. At the moment of the believer's regeneration, the Spirit lives and dwells within you. And as we pursue and live in the Spirit, the unity, the cohesion, that spiritual superglue, that uh, Godhead adhesive, that is what will hold us together. Because we don't look the same. We don't have the same backgrounds. You're not from the same place as me. We don't have the same experiences. But despite all of the things that were different, we do have one thing that we can come back to, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is his birth, death, life, resurrection, and ascension, where he now sits continuously still praying for us, just like he was praying for us in the garden. Our oneness together is sacred. Jesus said that each one of us, we're like a body. We have a role and a function, and we're built up into a spiritual house. We're going to talk about that in the coming weeks, being built up into a spiritual house. It is sacred to be a part of that spiritual house. It's not something that we can flippantly enter into and say, here I am, God. No, it's actually like, okay, I, we can come boldly before the throne, but also in reverence on our knees saying, God, I need your spirit today to empower me in my marriage, to empower me with my kids, to empower me with my neighbors God, to help me fight sin, because if we're not fighting sin, it's going to kill us. Like Jay talked about last week, you don't have the power to fight sin. The Holy Spirit is the one in you that is helping you. He's equipping you. He's strengthening you. And we have to be unified as the church. Jesus prayed it, that they might be completely one. In another translation, it says perfectly one. We don't have to be perfect we do need to be progressing towards perfection. There is something about the Spirit that unifies believers, and not just believers in Cedar Rapids, believers across the country and believers across the world, that the Spirit of God is working in each one of us across the world, millions and millions and millions of people throughout eternity as well. Like from the beginning of time to now, God had, the Spirit of God has been working for one unified purpose. It hasn't changed and so as we are living in that, God wants to use you and he wants to use me and he wants to see us running parallel. Even though we're different, he wants to see us running parallel towards the mission. And so he's given the spirit for that. We're actually gonna watch a testimony right now um, from Amgad. And there's some things I want you to pay attention to. Is who were the people in Amgad's life that were working differently yet parallel to bring Amgad to the, to the understanding that Jesus is Lord. So go ahead and watch this. Um, and my story kind of, I'd say, picks up in um, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I came to faith in Christ a little bit later um, from a Muslim background. Living in Saudi Arabia for 12 years, I had the opportunity to go to Mecca. Um, I had an Arabic tutor and an Islamic studies tutor. Um, so I learned all about my religion and graduated from high school a little bit early. I was 16. 
I went to college at the University of Nebraska Lincoln um, after I graduated. So um, was excited to share who I was as a Muslim to um, you know to my American peers, and I just felt like everybody looked at me as a project and. Whatever religion they were, they wanted to convert me to their religion. And I welcomed those conversations because I felt like Islam was truly a beautiful religion. Uh, the cool thing about this um, series that we're talking about, the Holy Spirit, is how God used so many different people through His Spirit to align um, for His plan and His glory. So many different conversations that were um, like divinely appointed um, and so many people that were willing to follow the Spirit and be obedient. Um, and my story is just filled with that. So one of my friends, um, Scott, was a uh, believer in Jesus. Just a couple years into our friendship, I could tell that he genuinely cared about me um, more than he cared about converting me to his religion. And so that personal connection was really meaningful to me. He, started to ask me, like, hey, Angad, I know you're Muslim. What do you believe about God? We spent from 6 p.m. to, like, 3.30, 4 in the morning talking about God. And I felt so honored for the ability to share who um, the God of Islam was with him that um, I genuinely wanted to know what did he believe about God. And so that was an instance of Scott being obedient to the Spirit at the right time really investing in me and, and that conversation led to um, many others with Scott and um, eventually Jenny as well. When I met her, um, the first thing I talked about was God and essentially it was because of my name and they immediately asked, well, where are you from? Uh, are you Muslim? When I said I was originally from Egypt and so that brought on conversations about God and religion but the thing with Islam is is that they do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe Jesus is a prophet. And every time it felt like um, just a debate where I was debating to prove myself right rather than to really understand who God um, was. Um, but one day I was feeling sick, and when I got home, I threw up. And I called Jenny that night, and I said, hey, I'm not feeling well, and she said, this is the perfect opportunity. You're not going to work on Monday, are you? And I said, no, I'm not. And she said, well, you should read the Gospel of Mark um, because we had a challenge with each other that I would read um, the Bible if she read the Quran. Um, and I felt like it was just an opportunity to prove her wrong. So I, I was like, sure, I will read the Gospel of Mark. And I started to read. But... Uh, this was the first time I had ever been, like, missed a day of work, and so I ended up missing Monday and Tuesday. Um, on Wednesday, I still didn't feel well, but I felt like I can't miss work for three days in a row. I don't, I've never missed a day of work in my life, and so um, I went into work even though I wasn't feeling well, and on my way into work that day, um, I just started crying, and I couldn't explain it, so anyway, I just wrote it off when I got to work as, hey, I'm just sick and don't think too much about it. Um, but that day at work, I was still sick. I shouldn't have been there. My boss could clearly see that I was sick, and so he sent me home. Um, and on my way home, all I did was reflect on, like, why was I crying that day? It's just so strange. It's not like me at all. And I went home. And I had two monitors, and I had the Gospel of Mark on one, and a chat session with Jenny on the other. And something inside me just prompted uh, me to share about uh, crying on my way into work that day. And that's really where uh, God kicked things into high gear. Um, she responded instantaneously, like, Oh, really? It's so strange you mentioned that. Um, I had a dream last night, and in my dream, you were crying and you were inconsolable because you were wrong about God. And that honestly was the first moment that I thought I had a little bit of doubt. What if I'm wrong about who God is? This is of eternal importance. And so she encouraged me to pray about it. And I just started praying. And my prayer 
went something like this. Lord, all I want to do is know you and serve you. At that moment, I had a vision, um, and my vision was Jesus reaching down from the clouds as if he was reaching down to me personally. And while I had this vision, I had this incredible grip on my heart. It's like he had reached into my chest and grabbed me by the heart and was shaking me by the heart, saying, Amgad, pay attention. This is so important. Um, And that was the first part of my vision. And the second part of my vision was uh, the imam, or the leader of the mosque in Cedar Rapids at the time. He was in front of a dark gray background, and he looked from left to right and looked down and said, we lost another one. And that was my vision. Um, So I went out of that knowing that Jesus was the Son of God, but absolutely terrified to pray or ask God for anything lest he give me more (laughs) visions or strange things. And the reality was that lasted 10 seconds. I just surrendered to him in that moment, and I said, Lord, if this is what you want for me and what you want to show me, I'm yours. I'll follow you. And so I went over um, to call Jenny and let her know. Jenny wasn't there, but her roommate was in the room. And so we, she, she's a strong Christian. Her roommate was as well. And so we prayed together. Um, and then um, I remember talking to Jenny later and saying, hey, where were you when I was calling? What happened? And she shared with me some other just divine appointments that were taking place, I believe, because of the Spirit unifying believers together, preparing us to do the work that God wants um, for us to bring Him glory. And so at that moment, um, she and she was with some friends, and um, they decided to pray for me at that moment that I was having the vision. That's just so cool for me. A significant percentage of Muslims come to faith in Christ through visions and dreams. Um, and so she prayed for a vision, and sure enough, that's, that's what I had. And I just think of so many people in my life that were planted at just the right, the right moment to share the right things that I, that I needed to hear in my journey as I learned about God. Um, my uh, cubicle mate at work was a firm believer in Jesus, and I just remember walking the halls with him and sharing the story of what happened. And he was just crying and saying, and yet you had no idea how many times and how many people were praying for you from our church. Um, so it was just so cool to see God work. Yeah. But that, that is a great example of us watching the body of believers around Amgad pray and be unified in the Spirit. That the, We don't know what's going on in people's hearts, but the Spirit does. And when he lays somebody on your mind, pray for them, intercede for them, say a kind word. Like, it is important for us to step into that and say, okay, Spirit, I don't know what the fruit is, but that's what the fruit looks like. When the Spirit's ready to reap a harvest, man, he reaps a harvest. And he wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants to use corporately us to a watching world who needs, desperately needs Jesus. They need us to be unified in the spirit, us to be listening to the spirit. You look at our, you look at the culture wars that are happening. I just wrote down a few. There's race, vaccines, masks, the social media wars, book banning, sexual identity, LGBTQ+. There's transgenderism, gender generation wars, there's right and left, there's tribalism, and the list goes on and on and on and on. The world doesn't need more disunity, it needs unity. And the only place it's gonna find it is with the people that are inhabited by the Spirit of God. That's you and that's me. And until we, corporately, each one of us, individually, Andrew said it, that revival happens in each individual's heart first. And when individual revival happens, corporate revival happens. As you press into the Spirit in the morning or in the evening, as I press into the Spirit in the morning and the evening with Jesus, that's when we become one and we go out into this crazy world and they see unity. That is the currency they can't get their hands on. 
You read in the Bible where people say, peace, peace, there is peace. But the reality is, is there is no peace. You know why there's no peace? Because we cannot expect a non-follower of Jesus to have peace, to have a unity found only in the Spirit of God. That lives within us. I want to lead you to a, this is really our main passage, but don't worry. Because what I want you to do is dive into this. As I dove in, it's Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. You can, we're going to put it up on the screen, but I'll also, uh, I'd love for you just to look it up in your own passage, in your own Bible. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. As I studied this passage, man, God was just wrecking my life. I, I was telling Andrew, I think that this message was more for me than it was for you. And I believe it's Pandora's box. When you open up and start diving into the spirit and the unity that's found in the spirit, there's no putting them back. Like it just, poof, it just kind of splurts, splurts out and there it is. So let's read Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. These, these are the verses that killed me. It says, I therefore, this is Paul, the pris- a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live worthily of the calling with which you have been called with all humility, gentleness, with patience, putting up with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We can talk about unity, and and that's wonderful and great, and we can talk about the Spirit, but this is where the rubber meets the road. The rubber meets the road when we interact together, when we as a body interact with people um, from other churches across Cedar Rapids. How do we treat them? Or is there a tribalism, like, I go to New Covenant. Well, I go to this church. And so, you know, we kind of like, there's kind of that weird, like, tension. But there doesn't have to be, because Jesus is our Lord. If they, if they believe in Jesus, then that is, that is the one. And so it says, when we, we need to, uh, he says, I urge you to live worthily. This means to uh, walk worthily or in balance. It means to harmonize your conduct with your calling. Your calling is to glorify God and be a witness to the watching world. That's your calling. And so to harmonize that, it means that we have to uh, dive into the Spirit and live in unity. In this passage, the disunity that they were experiencing was between Jews and Gentiles. There was that wall of hostility. Well, I'm a Jew, and I do the law, and you're a Gentile, and you eat meat? Whoa. Like, right, there's a huge, there's just so many differences between how the two peoples were. But in Christ Jesus, that wall of hostility was broken down. So he says, I urge you to live worthily of the calling with which you've been called. That that word worthy is huge. And worthy happens when you're in communion with the Spirit of God. But you'll notice that after that, there's three um, virtues which contribute to unity in the church. It's humility, gentleness, and patience. Just do a quick assessment this week, how humble have you been? How humble have you been? Or is it your way, the highway, my way only? Or is it, you know what? Actually, the Spirit of God, I don't know everything there is. I'm not an expert on God. And even while I think this is who God is, I might be incorrect. How gentle have you been with your kids? In that crazy moment in the car coming to church, how gentle and loving were you with your kids? I know that. That's like the the thing, man. Satan just loves to hit those moments. Gentleness is the opposite of self-assertion. A gentle person is one whose emotions are under control. Are you under control? More importantly, not under your own control. Are you under the control of the Spirit? Because that's what truly is important. Patience. Patience is endurance under affliction. Have you been... uh, beaten by somebody who called you their friend. They, they, they were your friend, but yet they stabbed you in the back and kind of twisted too. Have you been there? Have you been patient? When you've been wronged, do you retaliate? Because you won't in the spirit. Patience is long-suffering. It bears insult and injury without bitterness and without complaint. The flourishing of the church depends upon you having these three virtues, It depends on you walking humbly, patiently, and with gentleness like our Lord did. It depends on you walking by the Spirit and being unified in the Spirit. When you flip the person off who cuts you off on the highway, that is not Spirit-led. That's completely you-led. That is your Spirit screaming out. But when you walk by the Spirit, you're not mitigating all sin, but you are 
lessening the likelihood of you seeping out and you're, you're increasing the likelihood that the Spirit is seeping out of you. I'm going to read you a few passages and we'll end on these. Acts 2, 17 through 18. He says, this is a, an Old Testament, uh, this is a quotation from Joel. He says this, and in the last days it will be, God says, that I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Notice the divisions he's going to break down. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, all of the barriers that once existed have been eliminated in the Spirit because there is unity in the Spirit. Because Jesus is now the commonality, not anything else. Acts 2, 44 through 47, if you go and look at that passage, and we'll put it up for you, but it talks about the unity that was found in the early church, that they were willing to give and to make sure that nobody had need. They were praying for each other. And you know what the last passage, portion of this passage says? It says, and the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. Do you want to know why? Because when Jesus said, I pray that they might be perfectly one so that the watching world will know that you have sent me. This is, the, this is the fruit of that. When, when people see unity in us, people will flock to our doors. People aren't going to flock because we're relevant. People aren't going to flock because we lessen truth and, and, and say, well, did God really say that? And did he say it that harshly? Is that really sin? God is, people are not going to flock to our doors because we have great coffee or because we're the most friendly. People are going to flock to our doors, people are going to flock to you in your workplace when you demonstrate unity. That's what Jesus prayed for. Philippians 2, 1 through 2, we'll put it up, but I'm just going to read it. It says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort provided by love, any fellowship in the Spirit, any affection or mercy, complete my joy And be of the same mind by having the same love, being united in the spirit and having one purpose. Our one purpose is to glorify God and to be a witness to the watching world. That is our purpose. And at the end of Ephesians 4, our main passage, 4 through 6, it says, There is one body, one spirit, just as you two were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and through all. One Lord, one Savior, one baptism. Unity is a big deal. When I was writing the small group questions, my goal is that while you're in small groups, you guys would dive into the passages that I didn't even get to bring up. If you search unity in scripture, if you've never done a unity search, you should. You've been missing out. If you've never done a peace search, you should because you've been missing out. Go because it will occupy the next like four months of your time. I am currently in this journey and I'm telling you, I'm on my heels. It is crazy as you dive in to this super spirit glue that the unity of the spirit, the, the, the spirit of God is working crazily. He always has been, and he's going to continue to work until we are with Jesus again, and all things are made in submission to Jesus' feet. That unity in the Spirit is insane. And you and I, as partakers of the divine union, I don't know how it works. I don't know how it works. But we get to partake somehow in the majesty and the glory of his oneness and that's where our thoughts are not his thoughts and our ways are not his ways. And we on this side of, the, uh, of, this side of heaven may never understand. But I'll tell you what, what is supposed to happen with us. We are supposed to be one. We are supposed to be one. And so I don't know where you're at. I don't know about this week or this month. Have you been a unifying force in your house? Or have you been bringing division and dissent? I know where I've been, and I wish I hadn't been there, because I haven't always been the unifying force. In your, in your, in your workplace, are you the person who brings that, that spirit of unity, or are you the one that everybody knows? They're the complainer, the griper. They're, they're the one who continually is talking bad about everybody else. They're the one stirring up strife and division. Are you that person? Maybe politics have superseded your belief in Jesus, and you're more likely to talk about the divisions in politics than the unity in Christ. 
that they see your divisions on the, the, the vaccine or race. Maybe you're known more for what you, uh, what, is, what is it going all in unity than you are known for what you believe in Jesus. We have to be unified in Jesus. And so wherever you're at, I think that this is just a call. This is just a call to pursue the Spirit, to lean into the Spirit. If you've let that aspect of your life slip, you gotta get back. You gotta get back, and so I urgently plead. And for those of you who have a a deep, intimate, day-by-day relationship, and you're just living in awe of who the Spirit is and who Jesus is, then my prayer for you, my call, my urge, my plead for you would be find, find a younger person who doesn't have that in their life. Because that is the only way that we will see the watching world just flock to Jesus. That's why it was so important. Unity is important, and that's why Jesus prayed. I pray that they may be perfectly one, as I am in you and you are in me. And so that's, our, that's my prayer. And so don't let tribalism and the other things get you knocked down or, or turn you away. But be unified in Jesus. That's what we have in common that is what we have in common. And so maybe right now you're sitting next to somebody, man, you got a beef with them. But it's a big deal that you take care of that. Such a big deal that we're told that if, you've got, if you're taking communion with each other, which is communion is a symbol of unity, by the way, that if you're taking communion and you've got an issue with your brother, you better go and resolve that first. You better just leave the cup right where it's at. Better leave that bread. You better go get it, solve your issue with your brother, then come back and offer your offering. It's a big, big deal. So... Let's pray. Father God, there's so much more. And I'm almost grieved because we can't dive into more. But Father, my prayer would be that your spirit right now, during this time that we've looked into your word, God, that you would have pricked some hearts, that there would be some people in this room who say, I need, I need that the spirit of the living God, to be that unifying force in my life. I have not tasted that part of the spirit. Father, I just just pray that a longing and a curiosity for the unity of the spirit would just overwhelm us as a church, that we would be one, that we would be perfectly one. Not perfect, perfect, but perfect in our progression, that we're working towards perfection in your spirit. So Jesus, help us. Holy Spirit, come in and help us and guide us. We need you, and it's impossible without you. It is impossible without you. And Father, most of all today, I pray that we walk out of these doors with our family and with our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers, and they would see the unity that your body has so that they would be in awe, so that they would say, wow, when they look at your people because they wouldn't see us, but they would see you. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.